let's start. Today we are going to talk about uh, non-convex concave mean max optimization problems. Just to quickly recap what we covered last time. Uh, so we started talking about uh, non-convex concave mean max by first setting up the goal. So here our goal is to uh, potentially uh, find some local mean max solutions defined as the following. So we define local mean max. Let's say you have x star and y star and my optimization is mean over x, max over y. I have an objective which is smooth and differentiable. So in the local uh, mean max uh, definition, we have fx star y star, x is the minimizer, so this should be less or equal to f over all x's if we are looking at global mean max. But in a local mean max, we want this inequality to hold at least locally for uh, a neighborhood around x star and y star. Similarly, we have the other side of the inequality. So if this is true for all X and Y in a local neighborhood around my X star and Y star, we call this a local mean max. Okay, uh, then we talked uh, about the stability of uh, our dynamics. We talked about asymptotic stability when we start close to uh, my point x star and y star, my dynamics don't uh, push me away. So I remain close to that point. And if it in fact converges to x star and y star, we say it is locally asymptotically stable. So the other definition of stability is linear stability. Or if we just use stability, that's what we are uh, referring to. And in the linear stability, uh, if you, for instance, look at the dynamics of uh, gradient, simultaneous gradient descent and ascent, gradient descent and ascent, so you get the following dynamics, theta plus one, theta is uh, basically x and y. So we have the following fixed point solution where f is equal to theta t plus eta times the gradient vector. So just to recall, theta is x and y, and here gradient vector is gradient, the negative of my gradient with respect to x and the gradient with respect to y. So why do I have a negative here? Why don't I have a negative uh, for y? You're minimizing x and maximizing y, that's why. Yes, exactly. So uh, here I have a plus sign because I'm minimizing over x, so I need to have a negative sign uh, uh, in front of my gradient. Okay, great. So we uh, talked about the Jacobian of uh, this dynamic, which is the gradient of my f with respect to theta. And Jacobian can be written simply as identity comes from the first term, eta times gradient of the gradient vector will be the Hessian. So I have the Hessian matrix and Hessian matrix is the following. Okay, so in linear stability, we want the spectral norm of the Jacobian matrix to be less or equal to one. Uh, here, if I look at all of the eigenvalues uh, of the Jacobian, uh, note that here, the Hessian is not a symmetric matrix. If you look at these two terms, so one is the negative of the other term. So the Hessian is not a symmetric matrix. Therefore, 
the Jacobian is not going to be a symmetric matrix and my eigenvalues will have both real and imaginary parts. But what I care is the magnitude of the eigenvalues. And if uh, the largest magnitude of my eigenvalues is less or equal to one, I say it is linearly stable. Okay, so this is also called a spectral norm. And then uh, we uh, had a lemma saying that if I'm linearly stable, if my dynamics is linearly stable, uh, where the spectral norm, spectral radius is strictly less than one. Is strictly less than one, not less or equal to one. So this is rho of j then it implies asymptotic stability as well. So therefore, at the end of the day, this is the, one of the main conditions that we care about. So I want the Jacobian matrix to have the spectral radius to be strictly less than one. Okay. Uh, all right, so Let's have one more um, definition. Let me see if, um, if there are any questions, you can uh, just write it in the chat box or uh, ask your question on, on muting yourself. So there's a question, what was the definition of linear stability? It's basically it. So in linear stability, I want the spectral radius of my Jacobian to be less or equal to one. Uh, if it is strictly less than one, then it implies asymptotic stability. Okay, so uh, we had the definition of local min-max above. So let's define strongly local min-max. Right, so in strongly local mean max, um, okay, so remember in X, I want to be, uh, you know, my X star to be a local minimizer. So uh, my um, Hessian with respect to X should be PSD locally. In the strongly local mean max, my Hessian, I want to be positive definite. So eigenvalues, I want to be bounded away from zero. So here, lambda min of my Hessian with respect to x, I want to be bounded away from zero, not be equal to zero. In local mean max, this is greater or equal to zero. Similarly, for y, I'm maximizing. So I like to be locally concave. Uh, the, the, the Hessian should be positive, uh, negative, semi-definite in the local mean max sense, but in a strongly local mean max sense, my I, I want my lambda max of the Hessian to be strictly less than uh, less than one. Okay, so that's the definition of strong local max, and you see why we need this definition. Okay, so let's understand this a little bit better, right? So in order to have uh, asymptotic stability. Uh, or linear stability, I want the spectral radius of my Jacobian to be strictly less than one. And I know my Jacobian is just identity plus eight times the Hessian matrix. So let's understand the Hessian matrix a little bit better. So Hessian matrix that we have for simultaneous gradient descent and ascent is in the following form. Right, so I have then Hessian with respect to X here, Hessian with respect to Y here, and these are the double derivative with respect to X and Y, and here's the double derivative with respect to X and Y. Okay, so consider this theta star 
uh, which is uh, let's suppose it is a strongly local min max or a local min max solution. So in that case, I know this matrix is going to be a negative semi-definite. What about this matrix? I know the Hessian with respect to X is positive semi-definite, but I have a negative sign here. So both of the diagonal matrices, they are going to be negative semi Definite. In the local min max sense, in a strongly local min max sense, they'll uh, be a negative, um, uh, negative definite. Okay, so the first uh, lemma that we have here, now I don't have a symmetric matrix here. My, uh, my eigenvalues, they are going to have real and imaginary uh, part. Uh, so if I look at eigenvalues of this Hessian matrix, so these are the real components of eigenvalues of uh, Hessian, and these are the imaginary components of eigenvalues of the Hessian. So my eigenvalues will uh, uh, can be represented in this uh, plane. So one interesting uh, property of this Hessian matrix that we get from simultaneous gradient descent, ascent is that my eigenvalues are going to end up here. Eigenvalues of Hessian. So my eigenvalues of the Hessian will not have positive real part. So that's one property of the Hessian matrix. Okay, so let's see why that's the case. Okay, so in order to understand it, it is a, uh, I abstract out these matrices by some matrices A, B, let's say B transpose, it is symmetric, doesn't matter, with a negative sign, and C. So if I have an eigenvector, let's say I have an eigenvector with two components, u and v, with the definition of uh, my eigenvalue is that if I multiply this matrix with this eigen, uh, eigenvector, so I should get lambda times the vector. Right? So that's basically the definition of my um, uh, eigenvalue. Now let's open this up. So I'll get two equations. So one would be a times v, plus b times u would be equal to lambda times v. And the second equation would be minus b transpose times v plus c times u would be equal to lambda times u. All right, so I'll multiply these equations from the uh, left by the V uh, inverse uh, conjugate transpose. And for this one, I'm going to multiply by U conjugate transpose. So the result would be the following. Let's see. So I'll get V transpose A times V plus V transpose B times U would be lambda conjugate transpose of vector V times V would be the magnitude. Uh, similarly for the other one, I have U conjugate transpose times V transpose V plus U C times U. Okay, now if you sum these two equations up, you get the following, right? So if you put these two terms together, so you get V transpose A times V plus U transpose C times U plus the other terms, V transpose B times U minus U transpose B 
transpose v equal to lambda times v square plus u square. Okay. So if you look at um, these two terms, so they have uh, each of them have a real and imaginary part, but because of this negative sign, they cancel each other out. So this term would be purely um, imaginary uh, uh, vector. So this has only imaginary part. Okay. Therefore, but the right hand side is real, right? So these are numbers times um, uh, if it's not real. So if I look at the real part of lambda, if I apply, if I look at the real part of these two sides, so what I'm gonna get, so I'm gonna get real part of V transpose A times V and U transpose C times U. But I know these matrices are negative, definite or negative semi-definite. Right, so this, the, the, the left-hand side would be negative. So it's a negative number. On the right-hand side, so the normal V squared plus normal U squared is a positive number. So I'll get real part of lambda times a positive number. So therefore, the real part of lambda uh, has to be negative. And that's basically what we have in this picture. So if you plot the eigenvalues of the Hessian coming from the simultaneous gradient descent and ascent, your eigenvalues are going to live in the left-hand side of the plane. So the real parts would be, um, would be negative. Okay, any questions? Clear? Okay, so there are questions in the chat box. Okay, good point. Um, can this be understood in terms of the linear time invariant causal systems stability? The real part of the roots of the system's function should be negative. Uh, Sai, if you unmute yourself, so I don't quite follow your question. Uh, so uh, there was a previous question in the chat too, like what, what is the, the meaning of linear stability? So for linear time invariant systems, which are stable, uh, the, the condition is that the roots of the system equation have to be, or the real part of the roots of the system equation have to be negative. Because if we construct the solution using the dynamic equation, we get an exponential to the power, uh, the, the real part. If it's positive, the system, the, the function just blows up. If it's negative, it goes to zero. So they say it's stable. So is that what linear stability means in this case? Exactly. So that will be one consequence. So uh, hold on to that. So I'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, Okay, so for asymptotic stability, we know that uh, we want the spectral radius to be less than one. As your friend mentioned, you know, it has some consequences in terms of the conversion. So let's understand uh, those consequences. Okay, so for asymptotic stability, we need to have the spectral radius we want for the Jacobian. But my Jacobian is equal to identity plus eta times the Hessian matrix. All right, so I think the question is, how can I relate eigenvalues of the Jacobian and the Hessian? And in, in fact, I want a condition 
on my learning rate. So here's my learning rate. So eta should be positive. So I want a condition on my learning rate such that the eigenvalues of the Jacobian, they live in a unit ball. That's the condition that I, I, I need in order to have uh, stability uh, for my solutions. Okay. So there is the following lemma. I'm taking it from this paper, but there's a chance that many other papers they have shown similar results. Okay, so the lemma says if H, my Haitian matrix, has eigenvalues with negative real parts, that would be the case, for example, for strongly local min-max solutions. As we showed above, my eigenvalues, the real part of the eigenvalues of the Hessian would be negative. Then eigenvalues of the Jacobian matrix would lie in a unit ball if and only if my learning rate, eta, is less than this expression. So I have the real part of my eigenvalue times two over one plus the imaginary part of my eigenvalue over the real part of my eigenvalue squared for all lambdas. So if I choose my learning rate, sufficiently small to have this inequality be satisfied for all eigenvalues that I have, then that will imply my eigenvalues of the Jacobian live in a unit ball, which implies stability, linear and asymptotic stability. In in fact, the convergence rate of my simultaneous gradient descent ascent to the solution to the theta star would be convergence rate would be proportional to the spectral radius, uh, basically a geometric rate with you know a spectral radius that I have. So note that if my spectral radius here is very close to one, I have a really, really slow conversion. So I don't um, like that rate. So I want my spectral radius, in fact, to be significantly smaller than one, maybe half. In that case, my convergence rate would be like one over, one over two to the power t. So I don't need many steps in order to have a have a small error in terms of my convergence. All right, so let's understand first this expression a little bit uh, more before um, you know, looking at the proof of this lemma, which is the proof is really, really simple in that. Okay, so again, let's look at that uh, picture that we have for eigenvalues of the Hessian. So this is the real part. And this is the imaginary part of eigenvalues of the Hessian. So from the first lemma that I proved today, I know my eigenvalues, they live in this part of my plane. So these are my eigenvalues of the Hessian. Okay, now let's suppose uh, my eigenvalues live, um, live here. Okay, so here uh, I have really large negative, large negative real parts, large in terms of the absolute value. 
Okay, so what happens in that case, this is the first term that we have here, the real part of lambda is going to be really, really large. Right? And then one over lambda is going to be a really, really small, uh, small number. So this eta, the upper bound on eta to force my eigenvalues to be in the unit fall is going to be really, really small. In other words, my learning is going to be extremely, extremely small. Okay, so that's what we don't like. So I don't like my eigenvalues to have really large real parts in terms of the absolute value. Okay, now let's look at another uh, part in this space. Let's say I have a really large ratio between the imaginary part and the real part of my eigenvalues. So roughly speaking, these will be two cases that we have. Okay, so in that case, the second term, so the imaginary over real part is going to be a really large number, so I can ignore this one. That will again push my lambda to be a really, really uh, small number. That's an upper bound for lambda in order to have my eigenvalues to live in a unit ball. And that will immediately imply that I'll have a slow convergence. So again, I don't like these two parts either. So if you give me a system, uh, a dynamics, and I plot the eigenvalues, and I see, okay, my eigenvalues are in these areas. So here I'll have a better convergence. Faster. Okay, so that's basically one um, uh, geometric uh, intuition why we want uh, to have some well-behaved uh, Hessian or Jacobian in terms of looking at their uh, eigenvalues because that directly translates into the convergence rate. Right? So if you are able to push your eigenvalues, your spectral radius to be significantly smaller than one, that will uh, basically imply a much faster convergence to your local min-max solution. Okay, so let me take some questions. Um, can you repeat the last argument for large imaginary part and small real part? Sure. So let's imagine you're in these regimes. So you have a really large imaginary to real ratio. So in that case, if you just look at this term, right? so we have imaginary to real ratio, this number is going to be a really large number. Right, so then you can just ignore this one here because this is going to be a really large number plus one, it's gonna be itself. So that will basically dominate the upper bound that you have for the uh, step size or the learning rate. So your learning rate would be really small in those cases. And in other words, your convergence is going to be very small. Make sense? Okay, good. Any other questions? Okay, good. All right. Let's look at the proof of this lemma. The proof is in fact uh, quite simple. But for completeness, I'm gonna do it. Suppose lambda is an eigenvalue of H, is an 
eigen of h. Uh, so lambda is in the form of, let's say, minus a plus i times b, where a is positive, right? Because I know eigenvalues of h, the real part of eigenvalues of h, um, um, they are uh, negative. Okay, so from the equation that I have, my Jacobian is equal to identity plus lambda times h. My eigenvalue, the eigenvalue of the Jacobian is going to be one plus lambda times lambda, uh, not lambda, so this is eight now. Yes, good catch. So the eigenvalue of my Jacobian is going to be one plus eta times lambda. And I want to look at the magnitude of this because again, it's gonna be an imaginary uh, number. I wanna look at the magnitude of this to ensure that it is less than uh, one. Okay, so let's just open this up. So I have one plus eta times my eigenvalue lambda, which is minus a plus i times b. Okay, so I'll put the real parts together. So I'll have one minus eta times a plus i times eta times b. Okay, so this is the number that I have. So I'll look at the magnitude of this, which would be equal to one minus eta times a squared plus eta times b squared. So let's open this up. So I get one plus eta squared a squared. Okay, so minus two a times eta plus eta squared b squared. So I want this number to be less than one. Right? So that's my, my goal, what I want. In order to argue about the stability, okay? So this one and this one goes away. So I can factor out from eta, right? So I'll get eta times a squared plus b squared minus two times a to be less than zero. And I know eta is a positive number, right? So eta is a positive number. So in order to have this inequality, what I want is to have eta times a squared plus b squared minus two a should be negative. So in other words, I want eta to be less than two times a over a squared plus b squared. So if you rewrite this, if you divide the numerator and the denominator by a squared, so you are gonna get two over a. Okay, so let me actually write this the following, one over a, two over one plus b over a squared, right? So then that's it. So a is the real part of my, eigenvalue, b is the imaginary part of my eigenvalue, a is the real part of my eigenvalue. So I get one over real part, two over one plus imaginary part over real part squared, which is basically this formula that we have. Right? Quite simple, nothing, nothing fancy here. Okay, any questions? No questions? All right, if not, let me uh, move on. All right, so th this gives me, okay, so there's a question. Do we have any control over what eigenvalues the Haitian takes on? Great question, in fact, you know, great uh, question for, for the next part. So this lemma gives me a condition that 
I can compute to see if I'll have a faster convergence, at least locally around my local min-max, or a slower convergence. Uh, because I can compute the Hessian and see how the eigenvalues look like. But what happens if you look at the eigenvalues of your Hessian and then you see that, okay, so you are in like bad regimes, like in uh, either have a large imaginary to real uh, lambda ratios or a very large, you know, real part of uh, uh, eigenvalues of the Hessian in terms of absolute value. So what can we do in that sense? Okay, so one remedy for that problem is uh, basically to add regularization uh, for gradient descent ascent. So regularization in the gradient space. So we are not adding regularization to the objective of or GANs. You can do that in order to perhaps come up with the Hessian matrix of your GDA dynamics that uh, has better uh, distribution of eigenvalues. That's one possibility. And there are in fact some you know, works that they have analyzed, for example, the impact of adding a gradient penalty to the objective of a GAN or some other uh, regularizations to uh, enhance the stability of GDA. Uh, but here, uh, we are going to look into regularization in the uh, gradient flow space or in the, um, over the trajectories that we have. So the objective function is going to be the same, but I'm going to change the way that I'm optimizing my min-max uh, problem. And you have already seen some variations of simultaneous gradient descent. So last lecture, we talked about optimistic uh, gradient descent and ascent that you use like previous steps gradients to correct some of your uh, current gradients. So here we are going to look into a broader class of such regularizations, right? So again, the idea uh, introduced in the paper numerics of GAN is to add regularization to the dynamics to ensure better stability. Okay, so remember in the simultaneous GDA, or dynamic is in this form. So we have theta, if we are looking at the fixed point of theta to be equal to f of theta, which is identity plus eta times the Hessian matrix, not Hessian matrix, uh, no, this is the gradient part. So. So theta plus eta times the gradient. So that's the dynamics that we have. So in other words, if I like it like this, so this is theta t, theta t. So we basically solve the following fixed point problem that theta should be equal to f of theta. Okay, so here in a regularized GDA. So instead, I'm going to solve the following dynamics. I'm going to solve theta t plus 1 to be equal to theta t plus eta, same as before. It's my gradient vector. But here, I'm going to multiply this with a regularization matrix. Okay, so this regularization matrix should be chosen in a way that it does not 
affect my local min max right so that's the main argument so if you if you add this regularization and then it suddenly uh, changes your local min max then in fact you are changing your solution so we don't want that so we want to add this regularization to keep your local min max as before however it perhaps improves the convergence or the stability of your dynamics right so r is chosen to not change the fixed point of the original problem. So that's basically uh, the, the goal that we have here. Okay. So that can actually, this goal can be achieved if R is invertible. So that's one condition that, uh, that we'll need. So suppose this R matrix is invertible. Okay, so we have the following lemma that Theta star is a fixed point of, let's say, let's call this, this one equation star, let's call this equation star star, fixed point of equation star star, if and only if the gradient uh, at theta star is zero. Again, it's a stationary point for my original uh, problem. Okay, so that's a good uh, property to have. So why is that the case? So there's an if and only if. Let's suppose theta star is a fixed point. So let's look at the direction one. Let's say theta star is a fixed point of star star so basically what i get is theta star is equal to theta star plus eta times r at theta star times g at theta star then theta star and theta star goes uh, away and here i'm using the property that r is invertible right so r is invertible then that means g theta star should be zero so the other direction is trivial right so if g is zero direction two if g is zero then trivially theta star is a fixed point because the, this term goes away so i get a fixed point in equality is a fixed point okay so here's the the, the place that we use the invertibility of, of R. Okay, so moreover, if G theta star is zero, otherwise theta star is the fixed point of the uh, regularized equation that I have, Jacobian of uh, let's call this whole thing so here i have f let's call this f um, tilde so that's the regularized version of uh, f that i have jacobian of f tilde can be written as the following that would be j tilde at theta star would be identity right so that's the derivative of the first part now i have two terms r and g both of them depend on theta right so i, I can use the uh, gradient of r times g which is the gradient vector plus r times gradient of my gradient vector which will be the hessian 
So one term I'll have would be, again, eta times r times gradient of my gradient vector, which is the Hessian. That's good. What about the other term? So the other term, it will have some gradient of uh, r times g, right? This is the vector that I have, the gradient vector that I have. But if I am evaluating it in my stationary point, this g is zero. So this whole term is going to uh, be zero. So in other words, Jacobian evaluated at theta star is going to be following this equality. Okay, so that's good because now I have, if I choose an invertible R, I um, keep the local mean max as before, but I have an updated equation for my Jacobian. So I have this term appearing here. So maybe I can play around with this term in order to have a better distribution of eigenvalues of the Jacobian. Because if you think about it, now your effective Hessian is going to be this matrix. Right? So that's basically um, the key observation here. So the suggestion, one such suggestion is to pick regularization as the following, identity minus gamma, times Hessian transpose. Uh, this is invertible if one over gamma is not an eigenvalue of Hessian transpose. And if gamma is positive, and I know eigenvalues of Hessian transpose, they are on the negative uh, side of my plane. so it's going to be satisfied automatically. So in that case, if I look at R theta times H theta, so I get in my regularization terms times H, I'll just drop theta for simplicity. So what, what do I get here? So I get Hessian minus gamma times Hessian transpose Hessian. Okay, so th this is basically my new Hessian matrix that I have. Okay, if you think about it, what happens in my dynamics? So my, my Jacobian would be identity plus eta times this new Hessian minus eta times gamma Hessian transpose Hessian. So this part is as before. So if you look at this part, Hessian times, uh, Hessian transpose times Hessian is a PST matrix. So all eigenvalues here are real. Now, if I look at this eta times gamma, uh, basically it pushes my eigenvalues to have slightly more negative real parts. So this regularization effectively, if you have eigenvalues here or here, so it pushes them slightly uh, to the left side of your plane to have more negative eigenvalues. And in that paper, they show, in fact, this helps in terms of convergence of GANs. But it doesn't have to be this regularization. So the reason I'm saying is that you can think about other regularizations that may improve the uh, stability uh, properties of your min max, of, of the dynamics of your min max. OK, so let me pause here and uh, take questions. Okay, so there's a question, how do we come up with R? So, here, this is one example, right? So R is identity minus gamma times Hessian transpose. And remember, it helps locally, right? So we don't know, you know, if we'll have a global convergence or not. So we are just looking at the neighborhood around my local minimax. And in those cases, it will help. Uh, 
so one question that you uh, you can ask is that okay now i have this Hessian matrix in my dynamics before my dynamics only involved the gradients uh, and that's first order but Hessian is more complex in order to compute but in many cases um, so I'll talk about Hessian vector product or Hessian inverse vector product in some other lectures uh, but you don't actually need to compute Hessian matrix because at the end of the day you need like a Hessian vector and that can be computed quite uh, efficiently. Uh, what about the third part? Region? Yes, that doesn't help. In fact, it makes it a little bit worse because you are adding uh, a little bit of a negative uh, real part. But that's not, you know, at, at least from the observations of this paper, that's not like a main uh, source of concern for the stability. Uh, there's a question to clarify pushing the real parts to be further negative only helps get all, us out of the high imaginary to real ratio regime. Yes, exactly. So it helps to get away from these regions because we go to the uh, left-hand side, but it doesn't help. In fact, it uh, may make this region a little bit worse because you are adding some negative real part to your uh, eigenvalues. Good point. Okay. So let me see. Okay, so we are good in time today. All right, so we talked about local min max. Those are the points where I have the inequalities like this be satisfied locally. So I have f x star y star to be less or equal to f x y star greater than f x star y for all the x and y in a particular neighborhood around x star and y star. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, fixed points of GDA, right? Simultaneous GDA. Uh, these are the solutions points that uh, satisfy the fixed point inequality equality of my GDA dynamics. Okay. So one question is that are they the same? So if I solve a fixed point solution, can I argue that the solution I'm going to get is a min max or vice versa? Right, so that's not the case. So if you think about it, because in min max, we need extra, uh, extra conditions to have a PST or NST in one side or the other side. Uh, so if you have a local uh, mean max, so here, these are the solutions I call local mean max. It's going to be a subset of fixed points of GDA. And in fact, I always know I have a non-empty set for my fixed point. But because, uh, uh, you know, because of the uh, fixed point theorem. So I know the, 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 the fixed point set is non-empty. But my local min max set can be empty. So that's a very important point here. So, uh, this can be empty. But here, here we have guaranteed to be an empty uh, 
um, obviously uh, under the conditions that f is you know continuous and differentiable so we always have those conditions this comes from the famous course fixed point okay now you can think okay what if i restrict myself just to stable fixed points of gda what happens in that case so it really doesn't matter. So even if you restrict yourself to only stable fixed points of GDA, local mean max uh, is going to be a subset of stable fixed points of GDA. And that's the result uh, proved by Daskalakis. and co-authors in 2018, I think same time. Another paper in 2018. So the result says in, in an unconstrained case, A strong local min max set of strongly local min max solutions is going to be a subset of stable points of GDA. So that's basically there, there are some other uh, technical conditions that they have in the paper, but that's the gist of. Uh, their uh, main results. And in fact, um, so I didn't talk about it, but you can also define um, fixed points for optimistic G GDA that we uh, discussed last time, and that will be in a superset of all of them. So it's going to be stable points of optimistic GDA. Okay, so this is a little bit unsatisfying, right? So because here, from a computational point of view, we solve uh, GDA, simultaneous GDA. And, you know, if we end up in a stable uh, point of simultaneous GDA, then we should be happy. But uh, those points may not actually be uh, local mean max solution. So what is going on here? So how can we deal with this issue? So there's a question, what does strong mean in the strong local mean max? I defined it earlier today. So the Hessian with respect to X and Y shouldn't have zero eigenvalues. So that's basically the, the definition of the strong local mean max. Okay, uh, good. So in order to deal with this, we can define approximate local min max solutions. Okay, so the definition is in fact really intuitive. We say a point, let's say X star and Y star is an approximate local mean max, is an epsilon delta approximate local mean max if, okay, so F X star y star, I'm minimizing over f. So it should be less or equal to f x y star locally, right? So for all x and y in a particular bond, ball around x star and y star. But here, I'm going to give a little bit of a bigger room for my uh, x optimization. I'm going to say I want this 
inequality to hold within an epsilon uh, error. So even though if it is not like exactly the minimizer, if it is within the epsilon uh, of uh, any other excess, then I'll um, then I'll be fine. Okay. The other side is uh, similar. So you have y is the maximizer, so it should be greater than x star and y. But I'm going to add a bigger room by epsilon here. And that happens in the delta neighborhood uh, of my point x star and y star. OK, so in that case, suppose f is g Lipschitz and l smooth. Uh, it can be non-convex concave. G is the bound on the Lipschitzness. L is the bound on the eigenvalues of the Hessian. It's L is smooth. Then let's uh, we, we'll have the following picture. So I can look at three ranges of my local neighborhood. Delta represents the size of my local neighborhood based on epsilon and G. So the two thresholds that we have is one epsilon over G. The other one is square root of two epsilon over uh, L. So if my local neighborhood is very small, epsilon over G in this part, every point is epsilon delta local min max. Basically, it's a trivial regime. Why is that the case? Because I have a to bound on my Lipschitz, how much my function can change. And uh, you can see if delta is less than epsilon over g, so I'm going to always be in this range. So every point is an epsilon local min max, not very interesting. So if my neighborhood is big, the local neighborhood I'm looking at, then it's kind of similar to the global uh, mean max problem. So this part is very difficult. So epsilon delta local mean max may not exist and MP hard to compute. But there is a sweet spot between, between these two regimes. So this part is difficult. This is hard. This is trivial. So here, epsilon delta local min max first of all, it is guaranteed to exist. And in fact, it is equivalent to the fixed points of GDA. So in this regime where my neighborhood is not too large, then I have this equivalence between epsilon and delta local min max and the GDA fixed points. All right, so the question is, is it MP hard to compute uh, in this local neighborhood around X star and Y star? Uh, the answer is no. There is a paper, recent paper that he posted that show that in this regime, the complexity is according to P path or a super polynomial complexity. So it is not polynomial. It is not very easy to compute, but it is not MP hard either. So it lives between these two regimes. OK, so I really like this picture because that gives a, a full picture of 
the approximation that we can tolerate versus the size of the local neighborhood that we look in order to see if we can compute these local min-max problems or not. All right, any questions? Okay, so I'll ask one question. Then the key question here is, so what? <laughs> Right, so in practice, in GANs, in adversarial training, in many of other problems that we have, we get pretty complicated non-convex concave minimax problems. And from this picture that we have, you can see for uh, at least from a computational complexity point of view that looks at the worst case, the problem is either trivial or very difficult, either PPAD or uh, MP hard. Even to compute the local, approximate local minimax. Then what can we do? So let's step back. and think about the single minimization problem. Think about single ERM problem that often ends up in a non-convex single minimization problem. And then we use gradient descent to solve. We talked about convergence of gradient descent in those single minimization problems to the global minimizer. But what helped us in that case? In terms of global convergence of gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. Fantastic, yes. Over parameterization. Over parameterization helped. Right? So we, all of the results that we talked about gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent in single minimization problem in non-convex single minimization problem, use the fact that in practice we have samples. So if my model parameters, the number of parameters I have is larger than the number of samples that I have, then we observe some really nice uh, properties of the objective function. And then we show um, uh, that if under some conditions, uh, gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent converges to the global solution. Then the question is, would over parameterization help in solving non-convex concave mean max? Suppose you have a GAN, you have a really large generator over parameterized, more parameters than the number of samples. Can I use again over parameterization to tackle the non convex, non concave min max optimization problem? Uh, so the answer is yes. So there is a recent paper on ICLR 2021, um, just submitted by anonymous authors.
because it's still in the review process, so it's a double brine process, uh, that talks about this problem. It's called, the title is Understanding the Role of Overparameterization in GANs. By the way, for those of you who are not familiar with ICLR, uh, even submitted papers are publicly available. So if you Google uh, this title, you'll be able to find the draft of this paper uh, by anonymous authors. So what they show is the following. They show, uh, let's consider a GAN problem. Consider a Washenstein GAN problem, uh, problem, and suppose generator is a, a neural network, one hidden layer neural network, one hidden layer neural network. And the discriminator is very simple. It's just a linear discriminator. Okay. So you get this following optimization, mean over g, max over discriminator, uh, some function that depends on g and d. So in terms of uh, parameters for d, because d is linear, so you get concavity here. But here you will be non-convex. So it will be still a non-convex concave. Cave optimization very difficult in general, even if you have concavity in one side. But the authors uh, have shown that if the generator is sufficiently overparameterized, generator is sufficiently over parameterized, then simultaneous gradient descent ascent converges to global min max solution. There are uh, more uh, rigorous bonds in the paper uh, in terms of like, you know, what is the level of overparameterization is needed in order to uh, have uh, the, the convergence. So this result kind of shows there is a path forward. So even though um, I talked about, I started talking about min max optimization problem in a convex concave setting, that's a classic R problem we have uh, really good understanding of many aspects of it. Still, there are some open problems, even in convex concave settings that I talk, but in non-convex concave setting, the problem is very difficult. Uh, even if you think about approximate local min-max solutions, um, there are some regimes that it is NP-hard, there are some regimes that it is super polynomial, and otherwise it, it can be just trivial. Uh, but these complexity results, they focus on worst case, worst case um, problems. What if we are using some statistical uh, setup that we see in deep uh, learning applications? Uh, one of them is overparameterization. And I think uh, this is an important um, aspect to uh, think about convergence of simultaneous gradient descent ascent or some other uh, approaches like optimistic gradient descent ascent under the overparameterization of the models that we are using in the training. 